You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music can only mean one thing. Yep, that's right. We're back. The option block is back. Back from our little bit of a hiatus last week, a uh, a seasonal <laughs> seasonal vacation induced hiatus. It was kind of fun. Markets already closed for Monday, so we kind of just extended it throughout the week. I apologize if you missed us, but we're back. You know that bat signal goes up. The markets go into a tizzy. They call out Avengers assemble, and yes. We are here. You don't get the Avengers. You get the Option Block All-Stars instead. I will be your Tony Stark for this evening, a.k.a. my name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com. I like this analogy. Let's see how far we can, we can run with it. With all the world melting down, we are here to hopefully allow cooler, calmer, saner heads to prevail before you. Or maybe you're enjoying this as you're heading to your own uh, bunker in the hinterlands of Montana. Well, however you like to enjoy it, make sure you sent us your questions, your comments, your insights, your pearls of wisdom. We do indeed love to hear from you guys. And let's see who we're hearing from today as the uh, the market is stirring everyone awake. Let's start off with a uh, guy we haven't talked to in a little bit. He is the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian, also known as the king of cash. <laughs> Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the program, sir. So who do I get to be? I guess I'll be Captain America if you're uh, Tony Stark. I was thinking so. more of like a Black Widow for you, maybe, you know, uh, or a Scarlet well, Witch. All right. I could go with that. <laughs> I, was, I could be uh, I could I see could you in, a, in like a cat suit kind of thing, you know, with some little electrical things, you know, blonde, red what about, hair. What about like Thor? Or I, you know what? Who I actually am is uh, what's his face? I'm uh, Loki. What's I'm Loki. We all know it. I, I should have gone there from the beginning. Yeah, probably. I guess Valentino with his long blonde hair would be Thor then. There you go. We do have the hammer of Mjolnir here in the studio, so if he, next, if he comes in, we can test his worthiness to see. Exactly. He, truly is, uh, he might be a little young to lift it yet, but his worthiness, uh, his worthiness cannot be in doubt. And also joining us from Parts Unknown, a.k.a. Under the Weather Shield at St. Charles, Illinois. But don't tell him I told you that. He is Uncle Mike Tusa. From St. Charles Wealth Advisors, Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program. How go things for you in this, shall we say, conservatively, not an Uncle Mike market, sir? <laughs> no, today's not an Uncle Mike market by any means, but uh, it might be a buying opportunity, but we'll see. Um, lot to talk about Uh-oh. today. Uh-oh, it's setting the table, so let's get to it. Without further ado, as we head on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block, the block of trading, the place where we talk about what the heck is lighting up the tape out there in the markets. And there's a lot lighting it up out there today, listeners, mostly, unfortunately for you Uncle Mike folks out there, most of it 
in the red, most of it in the dark side, the downside here, and pretty firmly. You know, we've been talking. How long have we been talking about on this network? You know, it didn't seem like the markets were really pricing in all that much concern over this coronavirus. You know, there was a few sell-offs here or there, and vol was a little bit elevated compared to typical seasonal norms around this time. But outside of that, it didn't seem like they were pricing a heck of a lot. In fact, uh, the week before we went off, the markets mostly rallied until the end of the week, and they had shrugged off everything. They, they seemed more fixated on domestic things like the political landscape than they did on these broad pandemic concerns. And then, of course, you know, over the weekend, perhaps we saw a little bit more worrying signs, random hill towns in the north of Italy being quarantined now with random cases that they they can't really attribute directly to Chinese contact. So that, of course, has um, agencies alarmed and they're shutting down hill towns there. And so, of course, South Korea having issues there as well. Hey, you want one of those brand new Galaxy flip phones that everyone's going on about? You can't because the factory that makes them is in the pretty much in the hot zone. So they're shutting that down. So a lot of these impacts, Apple, of course, warning, which is something we've seen for a while. Wuhan is, is a central area for production for a lot of these devices everyone here in the West loves to gobble up. So it seemed like only a matter of time until we'd see the impact on that production. We're starting to see that all trickle through now and pretty much just collectively get embraced to the downside here by the market. As we're coming into showtime now, listeners, Most of the major indices still firmly in the red. It seemed like maybe we would reverse the trend a little bit for a while. You know how it plays out. You see this dire sell-off on bad news, and then calmer, saner heads prevail, and we rally a bit. Lately, it's been we even end the day unched or up. Not so much today coming into the show now. We're still seeing everything pretty much firmly in the red, perhaps even, in fact, it is firmer than they were to start the day, which is not a good sign for you Uncle Mike types out there as we're coming into the show right now. The S&P off about three and a third percent we're seeing the dow off three and a half percent nasdaq leading the charge to the downside nearly off four percent 3.94 percent or so out there gold obviously rally home mode north of that 1600 level 1676 up about 27 28 handles and of course the product that can't pretty much catch a bid to save its life a wti continuing to the downside back off about two and almost three handles about two and three quarter handles so Still north of that 50 handle, but ever, ever so slightly there. And, of course, our old friend, ye old volatility index. Some of you may have heard of it, called the VIX, is feeling its oats today. It's been all over the place, 22, 21. Now it's up about 24 and a half. That puts it up over 10 handles, (laughs) about 10 and a quarter handles from where it was this time on our last show, listeners, which was Thursday the 13th, actually, so a whopping 10 days ago. Blame the President's Day holiday here in the U.S. listeners. It's all their fault that we were off last week. So, yeah, it's been quite a while since we've chatted with you. And in that time, the volatility landscape has, shall we say, changed to the tune of up 10 and a quarter handles. VVIX, a.k.a. the volatility of volatility. Guess what? If VIX is up 10 handles, VVIX is going to be up there as well. And that's at 111 right now. So we always say when it gets in triple digits, start paying attention. We're firmly in triple digits now, listeners. Up 12 handles from our last show here together. And our old friend VXX, that can do nothing but a road. Not this week. Up about three and a half handles. Puts it a little bit north of 17, about 17.15 right now. So all that juicy erosion that it packed in right back up. Our old friend 50 Cent, at least on the option side of his portfolio in Vixland, probably smiling. Maybe on the other portfolio, the credit side, maybe not so much. But uh, on the option side, he is indeed smiling. So let's start there. I kind of joked at the top of the show that he's the king of cash, but that might indeed be the case. Mr. Mister Meatball, sir, walk us through what's been lighting up your tape since the last time we chatted these last 10 or so days on the ball space. What are your crazies in the uh, pit chat up to? And then what's going on with uh, you guys being all in cash? Uh-oh, I think you pulled an Andrew, sir. I think you, uh, I think you, dro- you muted yourself. Yeah, all right. I'm here. I'm here. here. I'm yeah, here. Yeah. Um, so on... And, and I absolutely muted myself so that you didn't have me in the background. So, and just trying to be a good host. Um, on, I'm kind of disappointed we didn't have a show on Thursday because that was kind of our first, what the heck was that moment that I've seen in several years, right around, it would have been, you know, call it what? 40, 45 minutes before we would have started um, started recording, the market went from basically flat on the day to down 40 
before it closed down 12. And that was our first hint that there was something up. Then we had a really kind of ugly day on Friday. And with really, with little liquidity, not a lot of money backing up any sell-offs, nobody buying. Um, I was telling that, quote-unquote, 50 Cent did not take any profits on Friday. Um, And... Lo and behold, you know, I said, you know, if we're, this is the, the setup that the 2015 setup all over again, the kind of ugly Thursday, random selling new, maybe a little news driven to Friday, really pretty darn ugly on news to, you know, markets are really jittery. If we get some really bad news, we're going to, we're going to be really bad on Monday. And lo and behold, South Korea is completely shut down. They're a little nervous. Italy looks scary. And so we have the catalyst. You know, there are two things that create a true sell-off. There is a catalyst and conditions. And I think that from a valuation perspective and and as much a speed perspective and a top-heavy perspective, the the S&P 500 um, has been kind of a powder keg for selling for some time. Um, we had 20% of the index in five stocks. We had, uh, you know, the Apple, Apple, the biggest company, almost double over a six-month period. Um, just a lot of momentum, a lot of valuation, and, um, a, and a lot of concentration. So all of those, those shuns, uh, created, I think, the conditions for a sell-off. And then all you need is the catalyst, the match. And South, and I think that markets were pretty much okay with China being a mess. Um, but when it turned into South Korea and Italy, that's when the money said, uh, oh, wait, wait a minute here. And how much are we up on the year? How much are we up year over year? How much are we, you know, how far is, are we from the 200 day moving average? Uh, And it is, it is selling. We are off in a two day period. We sold off 150 points and the SPX is still almost 200 points from its 200 day moving average. The spread between the 50 day and the 200 is the widest that it's been in years. Um, So we have a lot of room to drop. Um, we have conditions that are in place for, um, you know, these catalysts to send us lower. And, and, and I think that's what, what we're seeing today is we had conditions then lit up by the, by the catalyst. So um, what does that led us to is a VIX curve that is now completely backward. And we now have the market saying we're going to see one and a half to two percent a day moves. For the time being, and we are, and we're going to set up a big structure that says, "Hey, if we're going to drop twenty percent, um, conditions are in place." Now, am I saying we're going to drop twenty percent? No, but are conditions in place for a, a real cor- correction, a true, um, uh, you know, a true adjustment in price? Uh, I, I got to say, yes, they are. And so, is it a buying opportunity? Long term, yes. Uh, is it a buying opportunity for tomorrow? I, I think that I'm in a wait and see. So that's why Friday, um, you know, Thursday, when we saw that sell off, I unwound my, you know, in our broad cap fund, we unwound our long position and let the market uh, do what it's doing. And we're still, um, you know, we're still in cash. And long a little bit of, of VXX uh, against our cash position because vol is going higher. And we could see a 30 VIX for the first time in a very long time uh, in the coming days. And, and who knows from there? But is Mike right? Is this a buying opportunity? I, I would say it depends on your, um, your, your duration. Uh, is it a buying opportunity for the week? Maybe not. Is it a buying opportunity? For the year, quite possibly. 
Interesting. I like your point about a lot of shuns. There are a lot of shuns out there in the market right now that are spooking a lot of uh, people out there. These various uh, conditions, contagions, call them what you will, out there that are that are causing issues. Well, I kind of like this point counterpoint because you know you're you represent the all cash movement, which I think is significant for you. I'm trying to remember the last time you've been on the show where you were you were fully in cash. I think it's been some time. So that in and of itself is worthy of note. Now we turn perhaps. We'll see. I don't want to put words in his mouth. Maybe, maybe he's still not in yet, but maybe not in buying mode yet. But he is usually our resident optimist, our resident permable, a guy who will buy when you are selling on those dips. Uh, we shall see. Uncle Mike, sir, first, uh, what do you make of these various shuns that are moving the markets around as we speak? And then uh, you kind of hinted at it. Are, are you feeling this is perhaps uh, Uncle Mike buying time or are you playing wait and see? Well, what are you up to? Well, I'm still playing wait and see right now. I'm like, what I did, uh, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the strategy block today, is um, <clears throat> uh, I got out of a lot of my position right at the open today uh, with what I did have. Um, I, you know, Just to give you guys kind of an idea of what I can be in, what I'll allow myself to be in within my strategy is like per contract, I'll allow for roughly, usually if I'm at... 50 to 60 deltas per contract of what I'm in, it's pretty high for me. And going into the weekend, I was in roughly 20 deltas. And so granted, a little bit, I got bit a little bit by gamma. Uh, but with this, I can say I'm still profitable on the year uh, for the, everyone that was uh, had started with me at, uh, as of this year. So happy to say that. Uh, but definitely took a little bit of a hit going into today. Um, with this, do I believe it's a buying opportunity? Um no, not yet. Uh, I think this could be, but um, with what we have going on, this is kind of like we're in a situation like what we were uh, at the end of 2018. I think I, I stole Mark Sebastian's quote then, uh, what he related it to Tesla, I believe, at uh, that time, and uh, I'm going to use it again now. So appreciate the, 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 you letting me use your quote, Mark. Uh, this is a market for crazy people right now. Uh, if you try to do something today, I think you're crazy, quite frankly, uh, unless you're looking to buy and hold a stock that you've been wanting to get into and you plan on holding it for a longer period of time. I don't think it's wise to get into a market today, whether you're bullish or bearish, quite frankly, whenever you have this kind of a move. Uh, and so with that being said, uh, S&P is back to close to break even on the year. Uh, we'll see if that support holds up, holds up. Um, I think that uh, if we do go below and like um, the th below the 320 level in SPY, I do think that is going to be some cause for concern. Uh, with that, the best year I ever had in my life trading relative to the market uh, was 2008. And with that, of course, 2008, the S&P went down 40%. So how on earth could I have had my best year of trading ever? Uh, the way with which I did it was that I created a rule for myself back then in that if the market is down on the year, and what I did that year was is that uh, I said, okay, it's the first day of the year, getting all set to do this strategy that I just broke out in 2007 for the first time that I'd created through years of study at Options Express that I still do to this day. And... What I did was the first day, I'm like, you know what? The market's down on the day to day. I'm just going to wail the markets up on the year before I put in my long option strategy or my bullish option strategy. Uh, and as everybody knows, the market never was up ever in 2008. And uh, it was a really good year for me relative to the market with trading. And so the rule that I came up with at that point in time is that if the market is down on the year, uh, I still do allow myself to have positions on, but it's going to be very minimal exposure until the market's actually positive on the year. And that's just one of my personal rules with it. Um, I do always say on this show, I'm long-term bullish, short-term cautious. I really am very cautious in the short term, and I think you have to be with this. Um, in terms of where we are from the market paranoia, what's causing this is short-term paranoia in that uh, we have the paranoia over the uh, coronavirus. And so that short-term paranoia might become longer-term paranoia. Uh, there's an old expression, the market can remain uh, irrational longer than you can remain solvent. And so with that being said, understand, folks, that trading is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So if you took a little bit of a hit today, and I'm referring to all of the Uncle Mike bulls out there, make sure that you have an understanding of the fact that if you had risk management in place, you should be able to recover from this. You should be able to recover from this as a buying opportunity, ultimately, at some stage. Now, let's say the market comes back up and we're only down maybe 40 or 50 points on the day in the S&P. I would say fear not with that, just from the standpoint that you don't have to catch every point. 
Uh, the worst things happen to people when they try and catch falling knives and they try and do things uh, that make them uh, break their trading rules, quite frankly. And the people that can stay in this business or that can stay traders for the long term are the people that uh, can manage risk and not do crazy things when markets go against them. I remember when I first started trading roughly 15 years ago, uh, the market was going against me. And just during the day, I was trying to make adjustments and I was trying to do all these things on the fly. And all it did was make things worse. Don't do that right now, folks. If you're thinking about doing adjustments or things like that and you're feeling paranoid or you're feeling horrible, awful, and you're getting all these emotions, stop trading. That's my advice for just about anybody at this stage. Um, and then just take your losses and move on with it. Uh, markets will be there tomorrow. And if you're worried about not getting this opportunity and you're not and catching the bottom, I would say fear not. The next opportunity of a lifetime will be there tomorrow. So with where I'm going with this market right now, I do still have a small call spread going uh, on SPY. Uh, it is worth probably less than 8% of my trading capital that I have allocated. I may have to check in, the, in a second of what I have allocated towards it. Uh, so I'm pretty heavy in cash right now myself. Uh, going into this morning, though, I had roughly, I would say, maybe 20, probably 20% of my trading capital deployed going into this morning, maybe 25, roughly. Uh, so I was a lot in cash going into this just from the standpoint that um, I don't want to give up on having a positive year uh, when things are going good and taking on that risk. Now, with that, certain things go against you. You have to be able to recover from things like that. Um, let cooler heads prevail. And if your head's not cool, get out. That's probably the best advice that I could say right now. Uh, catch your breath. And even if you miss the market coming back a little bit and you, you see the market, the S and SPY go up to 340 in three days, which it easily could in markets like this. If you see that, just understand and take this as a lesson that you maybe shouldn't have been that exposed in the first place. If indeed you are feeling painful emotions. Um, I'll yeah, talk Mike, a little bit more about some specific strategy here in a little, and once we get to the strategy block. Yeah, Mike, you're actually hitting the nail on the head, and, and you bring up a strong point on why we could actually go significantly lower, is that we're still up on the year, and year over year, I mean, the returns that we've seen since kind of the bottom of December, or even if you want to say... You know, let's take it back to like October 1st of 2018. Um, the returns that we've seen, uh, we're still, the S&P is still up, what, 400 points from its top in, in like, you know, a couple of years ago. And so there is a real penchant for, I think, the smart money to say, why in the world would I want to deal with this crap when I could just be in cash? And so I think the, the answer to, to my, you know, kind of a, a way to think about and to wrap up what Mike just said is, you know, he would rather buy 3250 on the way to 3400 than 3200 on the way down to 3000 before it runs to 3400 3, because, um, you know, buying on the up move is a far better, easier, smart solution. I think the lone exception is if you're sitting on a ton of dry powder, uh, you got to wonder whether there's some, it, you know, it, selling puts here is an interesting idea uh, in, in a few names that you really, really like uh, or names that you think are, are excessively cheap. I don't know what those would be, but like Mike said, if, if you've been eyeing some names and, are, and looking to get in, uh, with where we're trading, uh, so you could talk me into some put selling. I'm trying to think. This may be a historic moment in the history of this program. Obviously, this show is it's long lived, but it wasn't running back in the in the dark days of 2008 when all the world was, was melting down. That might be probably the last time the two of you might have been on the same page when it comes to both being all or predominantly in cash, but that sounds like where we find ourselves right now, listeners. Both Uncle Mike, the permeable, ever optimistic, and a little bit more cynical Mr. Meatball, both on the same page, both predominantly in cash right now. Interesting stuff, perhaps not what you bulls out there 
want to hear, who always want to buy the dip, all you folks out there in stock twits and others always uh, tweeting out BTFD. Maybe you don't want to hear that today, but interesting stuff. Uncle Mike will provide a little more color on exactly what he's up to with that cash and maybe some of those residual positions he has and in a little bit on the strategy block. But right now, let's break down what the heck is going on out there in this market. What is trading out there? Let's start with our old friend Vix. Like Mr. Meatball mentioned, I haven't had a chance to see if he's come back in today, but so far on Friday, uh, Mr. Mr. 50 Cent did not take his profits off the table, at least on the option side of his position. But we're seeing some some folks trading it up out there in VIX land to the tune of closing in on a million contracts. As of a few, mil- few minutes ago, it was about 967,000 contracts on the tape. That's over 2x uh, the ADV out there right now, which is shy of half a million. Uh, so it uh, looks like, as you might expect, a pretty robust day out in VIX land. SPY, same deal. The ADV out there is about 3.3 million, over four and a quarter million contracts on the tape. As of just, uh, just a few minutes ago, the S, same deal. Uh, the ADV is 1.4 million at 1.6 million. As of uh, just shortly ago, the Qs, been a while since we've talked an M in the queues, but that's what we got out there today, uh, over a little bit north of 1 million, about 1.05 million contracts on the tape as of a few minutes ago. Not surprising, NASDAQ is outperforming everything to the downside. It, it likes to lead to the upside and to the downside, and unfortunately, to the, today it's leading to the downside and doing about 1.05 million contracts. The ADV has been pretty robust of late as well, about 863,000 contracts, so it has been very active out there in the queues, but it's been a while since we've seen an M out there in the Q's land. Russell doing also similar explosive paper. Uh, IWM closing in on 600,000 contracts. The ADV about 350,000 contracts. So closing in on two exits ADV out there as well. Let's see what's lighting it up in the broad, I should say, in the individual uh, equity options out there. Some weird names in our top 10. Maybe not all names you might expect. Cost you about 150,000 contracts to break into the top 10 today. That gets you to, to NVIDIA, number 10. Interesting choice for a big a big trader today out there. Buck forty nine is how many contracts they put up so far today. Number nine, Amazon, one hundred and sixty four thousand contracts. Number eight, Baba. Now we're getting some names I think people might have expected in the top ten today. One hundred seventy eight thousand there. Number seven, good old Gilead, or however the heck you pronounce that one. Uh, the, the one they've been linked. With this coronavirus in the past, and we've seen big moves from them uh, as a result, and that's happening today, 234,000 contracts on the tape for them. Number six, Facebook. Folks apparently sharing messages about this coronavirus to the tune of about 238,000 contracts. Number five, Bank of America, 246,000, another interesting one out there. Number four, Tesla. You know, they, they, a lot of their news has been driven out of China of late, getting those plants up and running and everything else like that. This... Uh, Prolonged contagion in that region, not exactly bullish for them, but 330,000 contracts, nothing to sneeze at out there today. Let's see where our old friend Tesla is hanging its hat right now. It is 834 and a half off a whopping 66 and a half handles, or about 7.3%. This name is just on fire to the upside and to the downside any given day that ends in Y. And today it's leading the market to the downside off about 7%. And a third percent. Number three, Microsoft. Another interesting name uh, to be in the top ten on a day where pandemic concerns are driving everything. Almost half a million contracts. 443,000 contracts uh, on the tape for Microsoft. Number two, AMD. A perennial uh, top tenner. Maybe you wouldn't expect to see them in the top ten today, but you are. And seeing a number two to the tune of 477,000 contracts. Number one with a bullet today is uh, the aforementioned fruit company, Good old Apple with about 628,000 contracts on the tape. If you're wondering, they're just a tick under the 300 handle right now, listeners. 299.70 off about 13.4 handles. It puts them off about four and a quarter percent. So outpacing everything, even the NASDAQ, uh, to the downside out there today. Now, we've been talking about this for a while here on the show. When's that other shoe going to drop in Apple land? Of course, they produce. A lot of their devices in that region that is now shut down. They have, of course, warned about some of the impact maybe on the demand side as well. People can't go out. They're not going out to buy new phones in that region either, so they can't produce them. The demand's weak, all that combining to hit the stock. But off a mere paltry uh, 13 or so handles, uh, which the stock that has pretty much doubled over the past year, that's not, not too bad, all things 
considered in terms of what's going on. If you want a little bit of a more focused approach, we can do that for you. If you're just saying, if you're bugging out, if you're getting to the bunker and you want something a little bit more focused uh, to sink your teeth into, we can do that with uh, Shake Shack today popping off. Let's see. They are, I believe, after the bell, yes. And Hewlett Packard as well. There are still some earnings on the docket. I know it seems banal to talk such things as earnings now, but c'est la vie. That's where we find ourselves Tuesday. we got a lot of uh, lumber and home names, Home Depot, Lumber Liquidators, Macy's, Cracker Barrel, uh, Salesforce, Weight Watchers. Wednesday, we got Lowe's popping off as well. So if you need your, your lumber and hardware retailers, you got it this week. Papa John's as well. Interesting mix. Etsy. See how many baby Yodas they've been buying on Etsy over there. And Thursday, we got Best Buy Crocs. Everybody loves Crocs, at least from a stock name, maybe not from a, a shoe wear <laughs> perspective. Jay-Z Penny, TD Ameritrade, is this merger going to happen? What's the deal? Maybe we'll find out more on Thursday. Beyond Meat as well. That'll be an interesting one. And so still are some big names. Friday, Foot Locker, Dell on Thursday. So there are some big names uh, to sink our teeth into here on the old show. If you want to see all those reports broken down for you, the Options Insider is the place to go. And the season report has been showing some interesting stuff. I encourage you uh, to check that one out as well. But now it's time for us to check out what the heck is popping off from a weird activity perspective on an already weird day. So let's get to it with a little bit of the old odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by the optionsinsider.com. It's time for the odd block. everybody time to get weird time to get wild time for the odd block the portion of the show we break down some interesting activity that is popping off on our radar here and you know i love i love our eye of sauron it doesn't care it don't care about no pandemic don't care about what's bothering you it's going to do its thing (laughs) it's going to find some interesting names that are lighting it up today that may not be what you expected and that's pretty much what we got let's kick things off here with our first name, you're thinking global pandemic concerns, you know, countries being shut down, quarantines, people heading for the bunker. This is it. It's go time. And, of course, what's the first name on your lips? Well, of course, it's B&G Foods. Ticker symbol BGS. <laughs> uh, this is the holding company for branded foods that was founded in 1889 to sell pickles. So deal with that as you're probably eating some pickles in your bunker right now. You know, they last for a long time. They're a good non-perishable type food. So there you go. Maybe you're enjoying some pickles right now. P&G, I should say B&G Foods is enjoying a little bit of downside today to the tune of off about 60 cents or about a little over 4%. This name trading about 13, 14 right now. Uh, so on the lower end of our spectrum, of course, it's been a, looks like a pretty rough year here for B&G Foods as well. Started off a year ago trading 24 and a half. So well north of where it is right now. And it's been pretty much Looks like a long, slow slog to the downside with a few fits and starts. It did manage to make its way up to about 26.60 or so in April. So it had a little bit of upside before really starting to sell off. That was short-lived. It was trading 21 a day or two later. So uh, then it kind of uh, dipped down. It hit its low. Right, we're pretty much right at about, about the low. That was today, it looks like, about 12.97. So not a good day here. For, not a good year, really, here for B&G Foods. I'm going to go out on a limb looking at this chart and today's action and guess maybe our Eye of Sauron found some put activity. Let's uh, let's check in to find out. Yes, I am correct, listeners. It was the March 12 and a half puts going up for 70 cents. The market, 60 cents at 70. So someone devouring that offer. Though I went up late on the Philly. So bear that in mind as you're parsing how this trade went up. Also worth noting, there are some earnings and they are tomorrow. After the bell, and it looks like a total of about 7,000 of these things have gone up now uh, since that initial print, so another about 1,200 or so going up since this one. So this is obviously a popular contract, and the name it doesn't do a lot of paper, lighten it up here on these puts. Uh, so interesting stuff, Mr. Mister Meatball, you know, it's kind of refreshing in these dark, dire times full of shuns to focus on something a little bit more fixated, a little bit more micro here, and that's exactly what we're doing here with BGS. Looks like somebody... Loading up on some pre-earnings puts for decent size out here 
in BGS deciding perhaps to maybe stop themselves out on the downside to the tune of 12 and a half. So that puts them out at about 1180 or so out there. Mr. Meatball, is that your take as well? Someone maybe a little bit spooked as a result of earnings and they want to get the heck out of Dodge? You have to wonder again whether that is the case. Um, yeah, they have earnings coming up, all that volume on the, that, those 12 and a halfs. Um, you know, definitely is a thing that makes you go, hmm. Um, is this a, uh, you know, I'm really interested, I'm actually kind of interested in them. So they're a, distri- a food distributor, shelf stable and frozen foods. You would actually think that would be kind of like a, a bullish thing with, you know, they're doing vegetables. I think they'd be lighting it up today, yeah. Yeah. Um, pizza crust. Is it like, uh, do they do they do a big uh, amount of, if maybe they do a lot of like exporting to, you know, most of their stuff is U.S., Canada, and Puerto Rico. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but I was planning on going to the store and buying out all their canned food and water because <laughs> clearly the world is coming to an end. So, um, you know, this is definitely a, you know, a, a things that make you go, hmm, indeed. Um I, although I, they own Ortega, they own uh, Old London, they have uh, oh cream of wheat. These are the cream of wheat people. Did you know that, uh, Mark? Another good bunker food. It, cream of wheat is a great bunker food. Also delicious if you put a little chocolate in there. Uh, you know, big fan of the chocolate chocolate cream of wheat. Probably my favorite. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's a lot of. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, – they, they own Don Pepino. Did you know that? I don't know if that one holds up as well in the bunker. Indeed. I'm not, I don't know. But anyway, th- this is one that you would have thought would, have, would be doing well, but uh, apparently not. Apparently, um, they're, uh, people don't want Mexican-style sauces when, and taco shell kits when they're in the, uh, in the bunker. You need your relish and your condiments, though, in the bunker. You've got you to gotta, you gotta season that, that cured meat somehow, right? <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. I, I don't know what the deal is. By the way, speaking of bunkers, have you reached out to Mr. Giovinazzi? Tell him to make some space in the compound there in the hinterlands. There might be some Chicago oh. folks heading his way if all this I, I, Oh, I will. Don't worry. <laughs> he's, he's, he's probably out ice skating. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's global pandemic concerns don't reach him in the hinterlands. He's out, he's, out, he's out living his best winter sports life. So, yeah, if you want a, a safe spot to go, listeners, perhaps the hinterlands <laughs> until all this blows over. I think we're going to come back to BGS. This is just a weird one they have earnings tomorrow so we'll find out pretty quickly whether these puts were a as used to say in the business a good do or not let's move on to another name you know global pandemics markets are roiling people are heading for the exits you know what's on your mind yeah it's archer's daniels midland archer not plural archer daniels midland (laughs) uh adm ticker symbol appropriately enough adm uh, trading right now forty two seventy six off a of buck twelve or about two and a half percent. This is a name that had an interesting tumultuous year. Of course, this past year for ADM, big obviously uh, ag and commodity linked name. Uh, it's been a tumultuous year for them. A lot of that on the grain side and and, and the ag side has been you know driven by the trade war. So we've seen a kind of a tumultuous chart here for ADM. A year ago was trading almost exactly where it is right now, about half a buck shy of it. And then they kind of vacillated around that level for a while. Then they sold off in June down to about 38 and change. And then they kind of rallied back up to the low 40s. And they sold off again in late summer down to about the low for the year, about 36 and a half. And then they rebounded from there. And they kind of had some peaks and troughs along the way to finally find themselves back up around 46 and change, almost 47. And then they kind of have sold off now back to where they're at now, about 42 and three quarters. So an interesting topsy turvy year. ADM, a name that is not unknown to being buffeted by the macro waves of the market. Let's see what our eye of Sauron found for us out here today. As I mentioned it's been kind of a topsy turvy year. They were mostly up to end the year, but in the middle of the year they were looking pretty weak. But right now our eye of Sauron picking up some June forty five calls going up for a buck oh three. So not quite lifting the offer, but close to it. 4,900 times the total uh, coming into the odd block of nearly 8,000 have gone up now of these bad boys. They were 97 cents at a buck 04 when that first print went up again on the Philly. 
Philly's uh, leading the charge. Oh, these are all Philly names here today. So Philly leading the charge on the unusual activity here for the odd block uh, today. They Worth noting, there are earnings, and they are in, uh, in this cycle. They're April 24th, so these June options, a little bit beyond that, but they will include a little bit of earnings juice uh, baked in there. So it looks like a total, Mr. Mr. Meatball, of about 8,000, somebody opening up uh, some near-term upside here. In ADM with an earnings cycle in there to boot. So this is kind of, I think you can probably title this as maybe maybe some old school odd block paper. Someone, I wouldn't quite say swinging for the fences, but taking a nice hefty, hefty swing for a triple or so here through earnings through June. Would you concur as well, sir, with someone, someone loading up here for some near-term upside in ADM? Yeah, that's a nice size trade, isn't it? And you know, it's interesting. I, I haven't looked at this one in a while, but yeah, that is a, a nice swing. And, you know, you got to wonder there with everything going on with the coronavirus um, and uh, and China, this is this and Tyson Foods are two of the more interesting trades that I think are going to develop uh, in the coming months as, you know, once the floodgates, once the, the export gates open in China, you got to wonder how uh, how food food makers like you know food producers like Archer and and the pork pr- producers of uh, of um, Tyson are uh, are going to perform because there is you know there there are a lot of animals being killed over there and there is going to be a, a food shortage as well because of uh, everything going on so it's really kind of fascinating how um how this could all, all all line up but uh i think some of these companies are in a position to do extremely well uh as markets open reopen in uh in asia yeah it seems like someone is agreeing with you at least to the tune here of adm so we're going to put that in our to be watched column as well you know we've been cleaning out that uh, that document of late all of our names to keep an eye on and now we're going to keep filling it up again with some new ones. We so so far we've got some size puts and some size calls. Let's see how we wrap it up here on the odd block. Going back looks like to the dark side this time in Masco Corp. Ticker symbol Maz, M A S. This is a manufacturer of products for the home improvement and new home construction markets. So a bit of a, a home builder supplier, I guess. Uh, making manufacturing 60 manufacturing facilities in the US and around the world. Interesting. I love our eye of Sauron. It doesn't care. It doesn't care about your coronavirus. It's going to do what it does. And let's see what Masco has been doing for the course of the past year. A year ago, it was trading a wee bit shy of where it is right now. It's at 4470 right now, off about half a buck or about 1%. A year ago, it was trading about 3770 so about seven handles shy of where it is right now. And over the course of the year, it slowly made its way up to pretty much where it is right now. It actually peaked out at about 50 not too long ago, it was back in early February, we hit around those levels and has retreated from those levels now down to about 44 and three quarters. So still up from where it was a year ago, about seven handles, but not really at the highs of around 50 bucks that it was just a few weeks ago. So interesting times here for Masco. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron found. Again, it was to the dark side. It was, looks like. Some put love to the tune of the April 38 puts going up for 35 cents, lifting the offer 4,338 times. Uh, these were crossed on the Philly, so worth noting. You probably have to cross it in a smaller name like this to get about almost 5,000 done. Uh, these were 25 cents at 35, lifting the offer. Oh, the old days when you had to improve the market in order to cross things. Now, nobody cares about such things. Uh, these went up, again, about 4,400 times. There are earnings there on April 23rd. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Let's see if that falls within the realm. Uh, no, that is outside of these are going to go out on the 17th. So these puts, interestingly enough, someone going to all the effort to buy all these puts, and they don't even get your earnings. Earnings are on the week after. <laughs> so an interesting choice, Mr. Meatball, for it looks like some hedging here and a name that is an interesting choice given what's going on in the market today and also someone making an interesting strike selection and a month selection where they're getting themselves all the way right up to the cusp of earnings, but they're not actually hedging the event itself. That comes out a week later. An interesting choice. Would you agree, sir? Yeah, maybe they're just kind of nervous about some uh, 
you know, some front running ahead of ahead of that cycle. Um, you know, that's not entirely uncommon. We do see that every now and again. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a little bit of a, a weird one. That's not one I, I would have expected, um, to, uh, you know, that's a weird spot to, to hedge. Maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's not a hedge. Maybe it's a, you know, you look at the momentum in the stock and you want to be short the name and don't want to have to deal with earnings, who, who, you know, or it could be this just has monthlies. And so they don't want to, you know, this is kind of the closest thing they could get leading into that, uh, that period. But, uh, it, you know, I, I don't entirely know what, what the deal is, but it, it appears to be something along those lines. Yeah, I'm sure it's a, more of a, a dearth of, of month and strike selection. Probably not a lot of weeklies here in Moss, and maybe they just didn't feel like ponying up for that extra month. But it is an interesting choice. If you're going to go to all that effort and all that expense and then not hedge yourself through the earnings, a bit of an interesting choice here as we keep on rolling. Speaking of interesting Let's see what Uncle Mike is up to. Both of them in cash today. What are we going to do? Dogs and cats living together. Let's find out as we head on into the strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the strategy block. All right. It's Monday. It's time to talk some strategy. I think we all need it. On a day like today. And Uncle Mike, sir, you're throwing a little fuel on the fire there. First, you mentioned maybe it's a, it's a buying opportunity, but then mentioning how you're pretty much in cash, which I think may may come as a surprise to a lot of your diehard, permable devotees out there. So uh, set us straight, sir. What are you actually up to out there? I know you're not just sitting on your hands watching your cash, even though that that could certainly be a valid position in a market like this. <laughs> but uh, what, what are you up to out there and, and what, do you, what do you have to say for our many listeners who are like, Uncle Mike, he's in cash. What do I do? What do I do, sir? I can't resist. I got to go buy some calls. I got to go, guys. No, just kidding. Um, so I want to go through selling. A, so I want to just kind of recap what happened with my aggressive portfolio this past Friday uh, and how I dealt with it on Monday. Because I think it's very important that whoever you work with, they go through the wins and the losses of what actually happens with them. Uh, And I want to go through what happened to me and uh, how I'm still in the game and how I'm still going to have a great year this year, hopefully. Uh, But I'm still ahead on the year. Uh, So with that being said, uh, a couple things. I have very, the way that I allocate client money is I have it allocated in various sections. Buy and hold money, meaning we own XYZ stock, and we're going to hold it. For that, I did absolutely nothing today, and I don't really care to do anything right now. Uh, if I had some extra cash, I would buy this market right now in a heartbeat because of the fact that it's buy and hold money. Uh, with that being said, uh, there's also hedged money with which I have. Uh, thankfully, uh, with my risk reversal strategy, uh, I actually had no short put on at this stage. So uh, that kind of how that's how I manage the risk with that one. Now, with the aggressive section of my portfolio, now typically the way with which I'll use that will be we'll take say maybe. 80 to 90% of client money put into bonds or tight collars or something uh, quote unquote boring. And then we'll use the other money for a more aggressive strategy. Typically I'll do this if client has a smaller amount of concentration in an IRA. So this way we can take full advantage of the uh, tax benefits of IRAs. I'll do the trading within the IRA and then I'll do the more passive portfolio moves outside the IRA. And so within the aggressive section of the portfolio, Going into this past week, uh, where I was at is that um, I bought an out-of-the-money call spread. Uh, The volatility was too high for me to be buying out-of-the-money calls, uh, so I bought an out-of-the-money call spread. I can't go into the exact strikes and expirations. Compliance will kill me with that, but I want to be as close as I can to kind of give you guys an idea of it. Uh, The way with which I have been financing the cost of the -the out-of-the-money call spread, and mind you, this is probably a 10 Delta trade, I'm guessing, from when I got into it. And just to have something on the table, I had taken a lot of profits from uh, the upside of earlier in this year, but I still wanted to have some type of upside on the table or some type type of potential upside on the table. I've been selling more near-term put spreads. And so by doing that, uh, not looking to make a ton of money with that, but just kind of looking to hedge the time decay aspect. Uh, 
And so with that, that works wonderful, except for times with which it doesn't. Now, I've said on this show many times before, uh, rule number one of trading uh, vertical spreads or selling vertical spreads, don't let them go in the money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. But there's always a caveat, kind of rule number uh, 1A, so to speak, in that going into this weekend, uh, my put spread was definitely out of the money. No question about it. And I was there was plenty of breathing room uh, for it being out of the money. I check it all, all the time on Fridays, right before the market closes. There's plenty of breathing room. However, there's going to be an event like this that happens once every four or five years. It happens to me roughly once every four, or at least to me, this happens once every four or five years, where the put spread actually goes in the money because of some type of overnight gap down. Now, how do you protect against this? First off, I want to emphasize the importance to where if you're trading in a levered portfolio, why you should not be naked, in my opinion. If you're naked and if you had naked short puts, meaning uh, you're using five to one leverage selling short puts in a market like this and you got caught, you're probably done right now. You probably you're very close to having blown out your account, quite frankly, if you if you were doing that. Uh, So make sure that you have an understanding for that. But now with this, anything can happen. And until you embrace that as a trader, you're not going to have any success doing this. So what happened this weekend is that my put spread actually went in the money. So how did I manage that risk? What did I do about that? I think this is very important for people to know and have an understanding. Step one of how I managed it is that I only did it within the trading section or the aggressive section of my portfolio. Step two of how I managed it within the aggressive trading section of my portfolio Sorry about that. Within the aggressive trading section of my portfolio, I had uh, lesser amounts of risk than what the trading portfolio was. So in other words, let's say that uh, you have $100 in your trading portfolio. I probably had at risk within that roughly $20 of that 100 within the put spread. So with that being said, you need to have an understanding of where you're going to be if a worst case scenario type of thing happens. Now, what's the final saving grace of a vertical put spread? Oftentimes, people think, oh, I don't want to buy that long put because of the fact that uh, you got to pay money for it. And what are the odds of it actually going down that low anyway? I'd rather just be levered. Well, even if you abide by the Mike Two saw two rules of selling vertical put spreads, rule number one, never let it go on the money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. That long leg of the put spread has helped me. I don't even know how many times throughout my career in terms of gaining money and using volatility in its favor when markets go against me, even when I'm able to just get out of it before it goes in the money. I can't even tell you how many times it's helped me. And obviously today it's definitely helped me. So with my calculation of if the uh, put spread were to go to being right at the money, where was my line in the sand to get out of it? um, I probably lost on a $5 put spread roughly a dollar twenty-five more than what I had anticipated losing if it would have been there, and this is when it went blew right through it. So, with all that being said, uh, it's hard to say exactly between a dollar twenty-five and a dollar fifty. But with all that being said, um, it's important to have an understanding that as I'm looking at this, I'm not thinking, "Oh boy, I blew out the account." Oh boy, I blew out the account. I had a bad trade. I had a trade that went against me. I'm going to live to trade another day. And the reason I'm going to live to trade another day is because I manage risk the right way in the first place. I had risk management in place all across the board. So what I want to emphasize, we do this on this show a lot. We say it all the time. It's important to manage risk. And today our, is a total reason as to why you need to do such things and have a managed risk portfolio. Uh, so if things do go against you, you're going to be able to recover from it. And you're going to be able to say, hey, you know what? I lost some of my profits, which is what I did, but let's live to trade another day. And that is the strategy block for today. Thank you, Uncle Mike. Very timely. A lot of people probably have some short put spreads in the money right now, and they're staring at them saying, what do I do? Maybe their broker is calling them. Uh, hopefully not the latter, but uh, good, good timely stuff nonetheless. As we keep on rolling into our final segment, it is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. 
You guys have a bunch of questions. Obviously, we'll have to get to them on our next show later this week. We'll try to work some into other programs throughout the week as well. Unfortunately, a lot popping off here today. Not time for the mail block on here today. But let's quickly check in with what we're watching for the rest of the week. I kind of touched on it at the top of the show. If, you're, if your eyes are glued to anything outside of the uh, potential spread of the coronavirus, then it's probably going to be on the earnings front. We have a lot of those popping off this week. If you want to know how many, what they are, what they're pricing in, what the vol is, all that good stuff, theoptionsinsider.com is the place to go. Click on that Options News and Articles tab, top right corner of the homepage, to begin your journey through the world of all things uh, earnings. Volatility is a lot to sink your teeth into this week. So if you're just done, you're just done with coronavirus, maybe you're in the bunker and you want a few trades while you're waiting out your time in the bunker, then uh, we got you covered over there. Let's go back around the horn. Mr. Meatball, sir, what are you watching and what are your crazies in the pitch chat? What are you watching as this crazy week continues to unfold, sir? Oh, third time's the charm with the mute button, sir. I'm going to buy you Pip boys giant mute button. Well, that's a, yeah. Well, you know, you got to wonder where, where do we go next? Um, you know, the Dow's down almost 1,000, the S- and has been down more than 1,000. The S&P is down 110. Um, are we going to tap unchanged on the year? Are we going to tap the 200-day moving average? Uh, you know, where does the money say, where does the money say, you know, this is enough selling to, to stop and wait? Do we get another shoe to drop? Um, I, I think that's really the, the big the big thing we've had enough catalysts where you know we could see selling for another day or two but i don't know if this leads to the major one but if we get that another another catalyst so like if i see a headline that says coronavirus in germany or coronavirus in france uh or you know new outbreak in new york uh look out um that is the kind of catalyst that we're looking for for a a true follow through on uh, what you're seeing today and and a a, a, a real run at uh, at the full correction, so that that's what I'm gonna be watching. Yeah, it seems like everyone is watching uh, those reports with with bated breath to see. Hopefully, we don't see any more like these sudden outbreaks, mysterious outbreaks in areas like northern Italy. Who would have expected the hill towns of northern Italy? I think that's what probably spooked. A lot of people out there. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, you're under the weather shield there, which I think also has a microbial filter to it. So you're pretty safe in St. Charles. But what are you, what are you watching until we gather here together on Thursday, sir? I'm just watching the numbers. I, just seeing, I, I think it's a big deal if we go negative on the year in the S&P 500. I think it's important to um, have your risk management in place. Of course, watching the coronavirus and all the news on that, of course. But uh, – the, the numbers that I'm watching is to see are to see if we can go to the negative side on the S&P 500, because uh, if we do, I think it's kind of a big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. <laughs> However you cut it, what's going on out there these days is a pretty big deal. Unfortunately, it's also a big deal that this program has come to the end. But if you're saying to yourself, self, I could use a little more in my ear holes well, we got you covered. If you're listening live, stay tuned. I will pump in some fun stuff about trading around earnings and maybe some answer question paloozas there with Brian and the crew there for OPR. Hit their 300th episode. Spectacular. It's a lot of fun. Maybe we'll pipe that in for you, too. And, of course, if you're listening after the fact, just hit next on your device of choice. We'll be getting into in a little bit all things crypto derivatives. Where there are some things popping off out there as well. How is this playing off? China's been a big driver. For volatility, skew, term structure, all that fun stuff going on in the options and the futures and everything else out there. We'll break it all down in about exactly an hour. But before we do that, let's go back around the horn, see what everyone else has that may interest you. Uncle Mike, this sounds like the kind of market where maybe I might want someone to hold my hand or perhaps watch my money while I bury my head under a pillow. If I was so intrigued, sir, where should I go? What should I do? I think the coronavirus may have spread to St. Charles. So uh, check him out there, listeners. The option. I'm oh, sorry, the option. That's us. StCharlesWealth.com is the place to go, listeners. And Mr. Meatball, sir, if folks are intrigued, they want to maybe have someone to help, to help explain this crazy world of volatility to them, particularly now, where should they go? What should they do, sir? All right, there you go. 
The option, option pit, I should say, all over the place today. Optionpit.com is the place to go. And on behalf of the Greasy Meatball and Mr. Uncle Mike and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, listening live. Stay tuned if you're listening live. We've got some fun stuff coming for you, and we'll be back in about an hour to talk all things crypto. Otherwise, we'll see you back here again later this week for OPR and all the other fun shows. And once again, back here on Thursday for Twifo and then for the Option Block. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.